widely, so frequently taught today that you as a believer shouldn't have to suffer hardship and that, um, you know, the problems that you're having, well, I've, I'm saved now and I shouldn't be having these problems. And here's what we do with the circumstances that come into our lives. Many times, the consequences of our sin, maybe before we're saved, maybe in the past when we weren't walking in fellowship with the Lord, the consequences of those sin require payment. In other words, you've got you to do your time. Israel's time was captivity. Did it mean they couldn't be right with the Lord? They couldn't be forgiven? No. They, were right with, they could be right with the Lord, and there were individuals in Israel that went into captivity. But what they had to remember was, we've got 70 years. You might have 70 years. You might be in a relationship. And you say, Pastor, if I were saved, or if I were right with the Lord, I'd never enter into this relationship, but I've gotten right with the Lord, and my spouse isn't right. How long am I going to have to endure this? Well, when you got married, you recognized an institution that was till death to us part. And so there's the answer to it. You say, Pastor, uh, but now I'm saved and I'm living right. I shouldn't have to have the consequences of my past. Uh, I should, you know, I know I shouldn't have been unequally yoked. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have to have these consequences. Friend, you could be walking with the Lord and you could be in fellowship, but you have to understand that just like Israel, if Israel had repentant individuals, but they had time that they were supposed to be in captivity. And there are going to be things that happen in your life that maybe wouldn't be your preference. I certainly think that if Daniel had what he preferred, he would not want to be the prime minister of the greatest nation in the world. He'd rather uh, be in a nation that wasn't in captivity. He'd rather just be a nobody in Israel. And that, that was the heartbeat of Daniel's prayer. And so now as he studies the Scripture and recognizes the authority of Scripture and believes that God's Word is indeed true, he says, God, your Word said 70 years. And so now after 70 years, um, and he begins to pray this prayer of repentance. And it's interesting, isn't it, that it, before his prayer is finished is where we come into our text. Look at uh, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2. He says, whilst I was speaking. In other words, Daniel didn't pray, say amen and sit down and say, okay, now God, you answer. Daniel said, God, 70 years is what Jeremiah the prophet prophesied. And now it's 70 years. I would not be surprised if he hadn't kept a calendar. Kind of like a prisoner on a desert island or kind of like somebody about to get married. You know, before you get married, I, I hope, I think, well, okay, like a kid getting out of school. All right? Yeah, yeah, when the first day of school starts, the first thing you do in your first study hall or first time you get a chance is you take your calendar, your planner, and you count from the day that or you, you, you count either if it's a spring semester, you go to the day you start Christmas break and you number one and then you take your calendar, go two, three, four, five, six, all the way back till you figure out how many days of school are left. You do that the first day of school and then every day you, or you put that calendar up on your whatever it is that you're allowed to have. If you have a locker, if you have a desk, you put it somewhere where it's visible and every day you check off your day. And that's about the only thing I was very diligent in in school was checking off how many days were left in school. But you know how many days are left. I'm not saying this happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if the day Daniel entered into captivity, he started keeping a calendar. And I can't imagine if this are true. Again, you don't want to make too much of something that's not there. But we do have the indication that Daniel said, Time's up, Lord. So he was keeping track of time either very specifically or at least very generally about 70 years but I would not be surprised if Daniel would have said on the on the day of the on the first day of the 70th year the anniversary of their captivity I wouldn't be surprised if he would have said Lord about today is about when they came and knocked in my door and grabbed me and took me to Babylon and uh, we're about 30 minutes you know on my birthday my parents call and say yeah I think I, I forget every year but I think it was nine in the morning that I was born which means my mom probably had a bad night but um, I think I was born at nine o'clock and it was Anyway, I'll find out my next birthday. If you call me next year on my birthday and ask me, I'll tell you when it was I was born because my mom will have told me that day probably. So, uh, but I think it was 9 o'clock in the morning. And so at 9 o'clock in the morning is a lot of times when my mom likes to call and say, right now is when you were born. And uh, so I can imagine Daniel saying, God, seven years ago, well, I, you know, he probably had a little sundial or something he carried around, I don't know. Seventy years ago is when I went into captivity, and it's time. And he started to pray and say, 
God, when are we going to get out? And he never finished his prayer. The Bible says in verse 20, Whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the begin vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, we understand that the altar was destroyed at the time of the captivity. And so we know, especially in Babylon, that Daniel, at the time of the evening oblation, would not have been able to, they would not have been able to offer for the sins of the day, the sacrifices for the sins of the day. But the Jews knew when the time was. They knew when it was supposed to be. So here he is, it's about the time of the evening oblation, and Daniel's in prayer before the Lord, and he's calling on God to keep his promise and God was on time so much so that the Bible says He caused Gabriel to fly swiftly. And so this is why I would I'd go so far as to say I think it was a very specific 70 years. Uh, God is not loose with this matter of time. Um, you know, we say, well, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, it's a thousand years as a day. Well, that's uh, a comparison to us of God's eternal nature. But friend, God is very on time, which is why you should be on time as well. Um, seriously, uh, six days for creation, the seventh day God rested, 24 hours exactly, 60 uh, minutes in an hour, exactly 60 seconds in a minute. Uh, God is very mathematical about these matters. And so it would seem as though while Daniel is praying, Daniel probably was praying at just the right time, and God sent Gabriel, the Bible says, swiftly. So here comes Gabriel, because it was the deadline. And so I think Gabriel, you've got to be careful about making too much of something, but I don't think we would be uh, inaccurate to say from the Scripture that Gabriel got there just on time. My guess would be it would be just at the time of the end of the 70 years of captivity. That's kind of neat, isn't it? Study it and look at it, and I think you'll be persuaded that that's the truth. Well, now, what is it that Gabriel came to... Or, or let, well, let me point out a couple of things from the text this evening that I think are significant that will help us spiritually, that will help us physically. First of all, it's significant that Gabriel is named here. Uh, many believe that uh, Michael the archangel... Uh, was a, a theophany or appearance of Christ. I, I don't think so, but many people do. Many folks would say, well, Michael uh, was, if you look at the things that he did and the things that were said about him, that he was a theophany. Anyway, it's, it's insignificant. But let me just ask you a question. Tell me some angel names from the Scripture. Michael, what? Michael, Gabriel, and Christopher. Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. We know the names. Well, that's pretty good. We know the names of three angels from heaven. I think, given the now, why would that be? God wanted us to know it. You ever driven a Catholic's car? <laughs> I've got one in my truck. A little pen. <laughs> one of these. Uh, God take care of my daddy while he drives. Is from whoever owned my truck before I did. I might have thrown it out. I think I might have. It's still there. Are you sure it's still there? Because I, I grabbed it to throw it out the other day. Anyway, it's a little angel, and it's an angel that represents somebody that the Catholics worship. And um, because we are a little lower than the angels, then man is so ready to worship anything but God. And I think that probably, I mean, look what we did. Well, look what the Catholic Church did to Peter and to Paul, and, and just to did the, the different uh, apostles in the New Testament. Look what they did to poor Mary. They're all saints. And uh, yeah, they. Uh, they were saints, but they, they, they started worshiping them. And so I think that probably there's a significant reason why the names of the angels are not mentioned because there now there are a lot of Satan worshipers, aren't there? And so that's very deliberate, very specifically done. But I, I, isn't it interesting that Gabriel's name is mentioned here? I just want to point out, do you have a question? Aren't both of those the ones that reflect God? There are certain ones that are right in front of God that reflect God's glory. 
Michael Gabriel, I thought. Well, 